Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. In his discussion of justice in Book One of On Duties, this book of Stoic ethics, Cicero is going to spend a little bit of time discussing what we might call just war theory in a very early state. He's talking about how people ought to behave during wartime towards their enemies. Can they do whatever they want or are there certain limits? If they want to be just, how do they have to behave, not only in relation to their own people, but in relation to those who they're, they're fighting against? And this is a very vital question, very timely. Even in our own era, there's much discussion about how we should treat enemy combatants. Do they actually have rights that we have to respect? Is it okay for us to engage in whatever deception or destruction we wish in, in dealing with enemy uh, states or, or organizations or populations? Or do we have to observe certain limits if we want to look at ourselves as actually having justice on our side? Now, Cicero himself is using a lot of examples from Roman history, and this is something that the Romans gave quite a bit of thought to. They weren't necessarily Stoics, the ones who say kept their word to the enemy. It was, it was part of, you could say, a developing Roman character. But the Stoics themselves also had some pretty strong opinions on this. And so those are kind of dovetailing together uh, in a new synthesis in what Cicero has to tell us here, which is going to be very influential on considerations of justice in wartime for people coming after Cicero as well. So he says, in the case of a state in its external relations, in, in relation to other states and the people belonging to those states, the rights of war must be strictly observed. And here he talks about, and this is coming from, uh, I think from the Stoics, how should we settle conflicts? What are our options when it comes to dealing with, with issues that, that people can't agree on? Like, for example, who should be able to graze their cattle in which places? Or which territory belongs to which group? Or how should commerce be going on? Or whether an offense has taken place by members of one group against members of another group and how that should be addressed? Or who should be dominating the Mediterranean Sea, right? All of those are, are issues of dispute. So how do we settle conflicts? Cicero says, there's really two ways, two fundamental ways. One is through discussion, through, you know, going to the other side and saying, listen, we want to talk this out. We don't agree about this. We're not going to like just give in, but we want to be rational. We want to be reasonable. What, what do you think? And that's often quite possible. The other way is by physical force, by, by um, you know, aggression, you could say. And he says that discussion is characteristic of human beings. So by the time that we get to using physical force, there's already some problems in, in how we're dealing with things. Things have already gone off the rails, humanly speaking. He says that, you know, dealing with things just by force is characteristic of brute animals. But we do find ourselves sometimes having to, he says, resort to that. So we resort to force only in case that we may not avail ourselves of discussion. So what does this mean? What is the upshot of this? First, we have to actually try to engage in some sort of diplomacy, some, some sort of discussion. 
Um, now that may not be possible in every case. We don't know somebody's language. We have to act very quickly. Um, but you know, this places a, a burden uh, upon one. You can't just go into a country and start saying, "All right, let's start killing everybody here," uh, and that's a okay because they're different than us, and obviously they don't want us being here, and we want to be here. That would be totally unjust from Cicero's perspective. Why do we go to war? This is another key point. Should we be going to war, as he's going to talk about later on, for glory? Oh, maybe to, to get, you know, slaves, to get people under us, to crush other people, to, to indulge our aggressive instincts. Cicero says the only reason that a country ought to be going to war is for the goal of what comes after the war. That is to live in peace. Notice there's two conditions here. To live in peace, to have peace restored, not to just be in war for its own sake, and to live in peace unharmed. In some cases, it may be impossible, uh, given certain types of, of aggression, to live in peace with those people unharmed. A prime example of this would be the battles between Rome and Carthage. Um, the Romans and the Carthaginians saw each other as rivals. One of them was going to have to dominate. The other one was going to have to give in. And they fought, you know, a war essentially to, to the bitter end. And Carthage was indeed, as the elder Cato had called for, destroyed in the process. But Carthage attempted to subjugate Rome as well. And it actually looked pretty, pretty bad for Rome for, for quite a while during the Carthaginian Wars, in part because of Hannibal. Um, so the reason for going to war lies outside of war. War is not something to pursue for its own sake. It requires a justification. It requires, you can say, an exit strategy or a reconstruction strategy. You have to be thinking about the peace that is going to come. So that's another really key aspect. Now, there's, there's a number of things that, that Cicero tells us about how what we might call civilized or humane people would actually wage war. Because they do, in fact, have to wage war. He is writing as a Roman. The Romans were fighting all the time with different peoples. Their, their very expansion to become an empire required a lot of wars. But there are certain conditions that are supposed to be observed. And, and sometimes, to be sure, the Romans didn't observe these. As a matter of fact, Cicero sort of speculates about, you know, I understand why we had to destroy Carthage, but why did we have to destroy Corinth? Um, couldn't we have spared them? And he comes up with a, a justification as an example. It seems like they were on some really good trade routes, and they probably would have risen up to become a, a major power again and, and, and tried to attack us. So that's probably why they destroyed Corinth. Um, but what are, what are some of these, these uh, ideas about how we ought to behave? So one of the key things is he says we have to spare enemies. Once we actually win, now if we lose, we're screwed. And there, you know, there is no worrying about what we do after that. But if we win, then we have to spare enemies. Spare enemies uh, of certain sorts. Enemies who are not barbarous or, or bloodthirsty. But enemies who are not cruel is another way to put it. Qui non crudeles in bello non imanes furet. Those who are not inhumane. Those who are not cruel. Those who are not just engaging in wanton aggression for its own sake. Um, if we can say that that is the case, then we don't have to spare them. Then we, we treat them as dangerous beasts who cannot you know, be permitted to, to continue on. But if, if they're not that way, then we shouldn't allow our, our own cruelty, our own bellicosity, our own passions to tell us, let's, let's do damage to them. That would be wrong. What else? Those who surrender have to actually be protected. It's not enough just to spare them. When they become our dependents, we have to take care of them. Think about what this would mean in terms of, you know, taking people prisoner in our own time. That means that we become responsible for them. We become responsible for their safety, their security, their human rights. 
This is a very important doctrine. Cicero actually, you know, stresses this quite, quite strongly. He says that, um, we, not only must we show consideration for those whom we have conquered, we also must ensure protection, uh, to those, um, even though the battering ram is hammered at, at their walls. Um, and he gives some examples of this. He says, among our countrymen, they, this has been followed so closely that those who've given promise of protection to states or nations subdued in war become, after the custom of our forefathers, the patrons of those states, the people who are, become their protector, their mentor, their guider, to lead them into the, the new peace that is supposed to be taking place. What else? War has to be declared. There has to be a number of conditions met, he says. He says, this is actually in the, the code of the Roman people. And this is a religious requirement. He says, no war is just unless it is entered on after an official demand for satisfaction has been submitted or warning has been given and a formal declaration made. So this rules out things like a, a preemptive strike saying, well, I think that they're probably going to attack us, so let's go attack them first. Let's go destroy their country. There has to be a, a, a cause for war. You have to actually submit to somebody and say, listen, you know, you've got to change things here. You've got to make satisfaction, or we're going to war. And, you know, you can give them a certain amount of time to comply, um, and, and you can, you know, lay down conditions, um, so they can't hem and haw, but that is a requirement. If that's not met, then it's not a just war, according to Cicero. What else? This is a really tough one. Promises to enemies must be kept. If you make a promise, even, even at the time that you're fighting to an enemy, Cicero says that you need to keep that. That promise keeping is an integral part of justice. And, you know, if you make a promise like that, you probably shouldn't make promises, right? But if you do, then you, you actually need to keep them. And he gives you a few examples uh, of this. He says, if under stress of circumstances, individuals have made any promise to the enemy, they're bound to keep their word even then. He uses examples of when you're a prisoner, right? Uh, in the first Punic War, Regulus is taken prisoner. He's sent to Rome on parole to negotiate an exchange of, of prisoners. Uh, he, he made a motion in the Senate that prisoners would not be restored in the second place when his relatives and friends would have kept him back. He chose to return to death by the hands of the Carthaginians. Um, he, in fact, fulfilled his, his promise that he had made. Um, another issue that, that comes up as well is uh, he brings up the example of Pyrrhus. Pyrrhus was one of the, you could say, great enemies of Rome. Um, Pyrrhus was the king of Epirus, which was rising as a power in what is nowadays uh, part of Yugoslavia, or what, what was Yugoslavia, now is just you know, part of that, that whole region there. And um, Epirus was fighting pretty, pretty well against the Romans. Uh, he mentions a deserter who comes in and says, I can poison Pyrrhus, the king. And the Romans say, uh, no, we're not going to go for that. So there's certain limits on, on what you're allowed to do in terms of the weapons that you use, the strategies that you use. It has to be, in some respect, above board. Now, one of the key issues that he does make a distinction about is um, what you're fighting the war for. So all of this has been talking about what we could call wars of survival. Um, where you, you, there is a real risk that your country could be destroyed, that you could lose, that you could become part of a different empire or you know, some other commonwealth, or just destroyed, wiped off the map altogether, killed, subjugated, uh, sold into slavery. All of these strictures apply in that case. It's also possible to engage in wars for, as he says, instead of survival, glory, or we might say leadership, hegemony, 
supremacy is how it's translated here, being in charge. And some of the, the wars that the Romans were fighting were in fact wars of supremacy. Who's going to dominate Italy? Will it be the Romans or the Sabines or the Volosky or these other peoples? And they conquered them. Cicero goes so far as to say, listen, all of these strictures that apply to wars of survival, they apply even more to wars of glory. If you're going to declare war just to try to expand your territory or mess around, you really need to follow these, these rules. You really need to make sure that you are being completely just or what you're doing is just naked aggression. And the other people could, I think, look at it justly as a war of survival and, and, you know, think that they're completely just in acting the same way against you. Notice, too, that there, there is no requirement of complete reciprocity here. Um, you don't, you know, you don't decide whether you're going to, like, keep a promise or declare war based on whether those other people who may be, in fact, bar, you know, barbaric, uncivilized, uh, you know, nefarious or anything like that. They, they may not follow that. But Cicero is saying, if we're going to be a civilized country, we have to follow these rules. And those are, in fact, duties towards both the enemy state and enemy people in war.